Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Brendan sent me a note to Steve, what's an Alford plea? Could you please explain that to me? And that's a good question. And I've been asked that before and I didn't really get into it. I thought it might be a little bit too far afield. But lately, I think that many of the people in my audience want stuff to go a little deeper, a little further into the weeds, as I like to say. And so an Alford plea is something you may have heard before. But you've got your guilty plea, you've got your not guilty plea, or you've got someone standing mute before the court. And they ask you to enter a plea, a variety of different things can happen, and an Alford plea is one of them. So just to let you know, if you get hauled before a court, okay, you're accused of a crime, you're charged with a crime, how do you plead? And you have the right to enter a plea. Now, I'll let you know, as a matter of course, if you do not speak, if you simply stand there mute, which you are allowed to do, by the way, since you cannot be compelled Right? So if you stand there mute, a not guilty plea will be entered on your behalf. Now, I've seen some people complain and go, why are they entering a plea on my behalf? I didn't say anything. Well, there's two choices, <laughs> guilty or not guilty. Do you want them to enter a guilty plea on your behalf? And actually, not guilty makes more sense because, of course, you are not guilty unless and until proven guilty. So to enter a not guilty plea on your behalf makes sense because you're presumed to be not guilty at that point in time. However, of course, the Alford plea is something else altogether. So you may have heard about this. One of the most famous cases is the West Memphis Three. I'll talk about that in a second. But an Alford plea, by the way, it's also sometimes called a Kennedy plea. And it's named after a case involving a guy named Alford. So that's how it got known as the Alford plea or the Alford doctrine. And it's a guilty plea that someone enters and says, I'm going to plead guilty to this, but I want to still say and maintain that I am innocent. Now, you might say, Steve, why would you do that? It seems to me that if you really think you're innocent, you should fight the case. And so there's a variety of reasons why you might want to do that. But let's get to this. I've mentioned before, uh, years ago, I did a video where I said, one of the things that always bugs me is how often someone standing on the courthouse steps after having just entered a plea of guilty, microphone in front of them and a bank of cameras, and they go, I'm here to let you know I didn't do it. I did not do it. I'm innocent as a day is long, uh, but I just pled guilty. And people go, huh? And I like to point out that in a typical guilty plea, if you go in front of a court and say, I want to plead guilty, the judge doesn't just bang a gavel and go, boom, you're guilty. The judge will actually ask a series of questions to make sure that you are properly informed of what you're doing. You're doing it willingly and so on, but also that it makes sense. So if you're accused of a crime, it's not uncommon that the judge will ask you on the record, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Or judge might even say in your own words, what did you do? And the judge will listen to what's being said and make sure all the elements are put in. And then the judge will turn to the prosecutor and go, prosecutor, does that meet the definition of standards necessary for a guilty plea? Yes? Okay. Defendant, counsel, do you agree that it meets the standards? And the parties all agree that they put in enough information to have a guilty plea be taken that makes sense. So a person will usually say, I'm pleading guilty because I did it. So let's assume there's a situation where you want to argue that you didn't do it, but you still want to plead guilty. And you're saying, Steve, <laughs> you've tap danced around this. What is actually going on here? Well, Henry Alford, the man it's named after, was indicted on a first-degree murder charge back in 1963. It's a long time ago, my friends. Evidence in the case included testimony that he had admitted to committing the crime. Court testimony showed that he and the victim had argued at the victim's house. He left the house and afterwards the victim received a fatal gunshot wound when he opened the door responding to a knock. Now, he was faced with the possibility of capital punishment. And it was under North Carolina law. And North Carolina had some weird nuances in the law that if he was convicted by a jury after pleading not guilty, he'd get the death sentence. So he at that point said, well, I should just plead guilty to avoid the death sentence. And after pleading guilty and sitting in jail for a little while, he realized that 
somehow he was kind of stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place. And he had simply, he said, pleaded guilty because if he hadn't, he faced the death penalty, which he wouldn't face if he pleaded guilty. So he was sentenced to 30 years in prison after the trial judge accepted the plea bargain uh, because he pled to a slightly lesser thing and ruled the defendant had been adequately advised by his defense lawyer. He appealed, asked for a new trial. It worked its way all the way up, Supreme Court of North Carolina, U.S. District Court for Middle District of North Carolina on a habeas corpus, and finally the Fourth Circuit, and then the U.S. Supreme Court. Case was appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Justice Byron White wrote the majority decision, which held that for a plea to be accepted, the defendant must have been advised by a competent lawyer who is able to inform the individual that his best decision in the case would be to enter a guilty plea. Court ruled that the defendant can enter such a plea when he concludes that his interests require a guilty plea and the record strongly indicates guilt. In other words, the defendant says, I didn't do it, but I'm still pleading guilty because the evidence might make it look like I did. And that's the thing, is there's a strong indication of guilt. So to enter an Alford plea, you basically say, I'm pleading guilty. I didn't do it. But I will concede that if I went to trial, there's a strong likelihood I'd, be, I'd get convicted. Therefore, I'm entering the plea not because I'm saying I did it, but because it makes sense for me to do it almost like strategically. The court allowed the guilty plea with a simultaneous protest of innocence only because there was enough evidence to show that the prosecution had a strong case for a conviction and the defendant was entering such a plea to avoid the possible sentence. Court went on to note that even if the defendant could have shown that he would not have entered a guilty plea but for the rationale of a lesser sentence, the plea itself would not have been ruled invalid. As evidence existed that could have supported his conviction, the Supreme Court held that his guilty plea was allowable while he himself maintained he was not guilty. So in a roundabout and weird way, he got the U.S. Supreme Court and it didn't help him because he wound up living out the rest of his years in prison and he died there. But the Supreme Court said, you can, under certain circumstances, plead guilty to something on the one hand while maintaining your innocence on the other hand, and we'll accept that guilty plea. That would be an Alford plea. So the West Memphis Three, and I'm not going to get heavily into this case. There have been documentaries and books, and all kinds of stuff written about it. But there were three men convicted as teenagers in 1994 of a 1993 Murder that involved three victims in West Memphis, Arkansas. Uh, one of the uh, defendants was sentenced to death, and another to life imprisonment plus two 20 year sentences, and another to life imprisonment. During the trial, the prosecution asserted that the defendants killed the victims as part of a satanic ritual. Due to the dubious nature of the evidence, as well as the suspected presence of emotional bias in court, the case generated widespread controversy. Uh, and was the subject of several documentaries. Celebrities, musicians, and others helped raise uh, funds for them. Uh, and in July of 2007, new forensic evidence was presented, which appeared to suggest that someone else had done it. So they went into court, and they're fighting over this. And apparently there's also a decision by the Arkansas Supreme Court regarding newly produced DNA evidence. There may have been some judicial misconduct. The West Memphis Three negotiated a plea bargain with prosecutors. And in 2011, they entered Alford Pleas, which allowed them to assert their innocence while acknowledging that prosecutors had enough evidence to convict them. And the court accepted their plea, sentenced them to time served, and they all walked out of court free men. Now, some people will note and say, wait a second, these guys pled guilty to it. Isn't that an acknowledgement of guilt? Except in the form of an Alfred plea, which is them saying, we didn't do it, but we'll plead to it because strategically it makes sense because by pleading to it at that point, they got off with time served and these guys had spent time in prison. So that's how it worked out. And another reason for that, you might say, Steve, they're going to sentence them to time served. Why do the prosecutors insist on having to plead to anything? 
Why not just let them go? Well, you may have heard me talk recently about people who were wrongfully convicted, who filed lawsuits against the government saying I was wrongfully convicted. I want some compensation. So these guys had gotten out and there was no Alford plea in place. They could turn around and say we were wrongfully convicted. But now if they turn around and say we were wrongfully convicted, the state can say you guys pled guilty. You may have maintained your innocence, but you did plead guilty and you were convicted based on the Alford plea. So these guys do have records indicating that they pled guilty to the lesser offense at that later date in uh, 2011 and the Alford plea. However, that allowed them to get out of court. They got out of court, got out of jail. They're all free now. They're free now. So that is the Alford plea. It's a weird, nuanced type of plea that you can enter where if it makes sense, you can say, on the one hand, I'm pleading guilty, but on the other hand, I'm maintaining my innocence. But the guilty plea is being entered for some strategic reason that makes sense. So there you go. It's named after a guy who uh, said that he pled guilty because he's fearful of the death penalty, but it gets used from time to time. It makes the news. So there you go. And Brendan sent me the question. Thank you very much. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Leto's Law. Live in the moment. It's all you've got.